Just um, we were just talking about speed reading. Remember speed reading? Like the, there used to be an ad on in the seventies from the Evelyn Wood reading speed dynamics program, where you know the ad was somebody looking at uh, reading a book and just like flipping pages back and forth, yeah. back and forth. And uh, I was never able to discern if speed reading was actually bullshit or if it was something that you could actually do. I think it is something you can do, and I became obsessed with it, too, as a child, because like my son Noah, uh, we have this that ADD thing where I, and probably a lot of you uh, have dealt with this. I know somebody else has, where you're reading the first sentence, and I would read it, and then I'd have to start over, and then I'd <laughs> read, and then my mind would wander, and I could not read to save my life when I was in school. So I saw one of those. You probably appreciated Hemingway more than Dostoevsky. <laughs> yeah, yes. Well, I mean, Hemingway, short, pithy sentences strung together uh, in yes. an incredibly boring way, if you ask me. I'm not a Hemingway fan. I couldn't even get past Hemingway, especially as a 12-year-old. <laughs> oh, too many sil- syllables? <laughs> yeah, it was, I couldn't focus on anything. I couldn't even read comic books, and that drove me the craziest because I like to collect them, Mm -hmm. but I couldn't bring myself to sit down and actually read it. So when I saw those commercials, and it wasn't that one, it was this other one. It was one of these infomercials. It was like memory power, and they showed the guy, just like you said, he looks at the page and goes with his finger. (laughs) Right. As though, and and like I was just, all I wanted in life was to be able to read and remember it, you know. So that was it. It never happened. I think some people are able to do that. The, the reason I bring it up is because, you know, we're having a guest on today. It's, it's Suki Jones, the great Suki Jones, who is a... Uh, yes, finally. Um, she wrote a memoir called Sea Swallow Me. It's an addiction memoir. She was a, a former uh, model, um, actress. Uh, she's a writer. She she's on the cover of the book. Reduction. She's but but I would call her a current model. Yes. Okay. Um, but... We're, uh, we're talking about speed reading yes. <laughs> because because her book does not currently exist on audio, Yes, which is how Nat and I tend to consume our media these days just simply because of a lack of time and so forth. So we were both forced or compelled. I wouldn't say forced because I wanted to read it, but we were compelled to sit down and r- read the book the old-fashioned way by turning the pages and having our eyes go from the top to the bottom of the page. It was a unique experience. Well, I, ha- I haven't done that in a while. Well, because you can't do 10 other things, and <laughs> I've gotten so accustomed to doing this thing while doing that thing and balancing another thing. And if you want to read, at least for me, I need total silence. I have to focus on it, and nobody can make noise, but... It takes all of my attention. I'm interested to see if we actually retained more than we would have had we listened to it. Mm. But I don't know. Maybe Suki will put out an audiobook at some point. I'd like to read it. Do you think that would be weird to have a man reading uh, Suki's book? Yes. I think that would be incredibly weird and also Here. really opposite to the kind of the theme of the, <laughs> of the well, book I, in I'm some way. Do, I'll do a random sample of, of what it would sound like. This is from Sea Swallow Me, page 97, randomly chosen. The next morning, I wake up with a terrible hangover. See? Are you going to read it sort of like in a half woman's voice, though? No, no, I think that would be the next like morning. I pro- woke up with a terrible hangover. <laughs> My head feels heavy, full of unsettled cement. Wait, uh, that does that does bad not one? sound that, like Suki? That's no. I'm not trying to say. I'm trying to give it like what it would sound like. See, she should read it. I think she has a good voice. I think she is going to read it I, at some point. It right? wouldn't sound good if if I did it in a voice. No, I don't think. it wouldn't. No, it'd be dumb. Um, or what if they got someone with like an Irish accent, just really throw everybody off? <laughs> it would be a struggle. Mm. It would be a struggle. You know what else is a struggle? Uh, staying sober. Alcohol addiction. Yes. So if you struggle with alcohol addiction, you're, you've likely tried to make January 1st your sobriety date at least half a dozen times. And it's January 31st today, isn't it? Something mm. like that? Or 30th? The 30th. Jesus, I ran out of money early this, uh, yeah. this month. Me too. <laughs> Crap. <laughs> Uh, if it stuck, great. And if it didn't, you're not alone. The reason most people struggle with keeping their New Year's resolutions is because they lack accountability. After all, who would really know if you cheated? 
Mm-hmm. Um, if you were using Soberlink to maintain sobriety, your support network would. Soberlink is the only high-tech breathalyzer system that will truly hold you accountable when cravings get a little too loud. Here's why it has our stamp of approval. Mm. You'll test at least this. Uh, at least you'll test at the same time every day, eliminating testing anxiety. My, my son is taking. Uh, he took two SATs and he's taking the ACT mm. in two weeks. Talk about testing anxiety. Does he have testing anxiety? Yeah. Yeah. He's a little, because, you know, there's a lot riding on these tests, you know? Yeah. Anyway, true. so if you have Soberlink, you won't have any test anxiety. You're not taking the SAT. You're trying to determine whether you're too drunk to drive home from the bar. <laughs> anyway, the devices have built-in facial recognition, so it knows uh, it's you testing. Mm. Tamper sensors flag any attempts at trying to beat the system, and friends and family receive instant test results, helping to rebuild trust and prevent relapse. So invest in yourself this year. Visit www.soberlink.com slash middle hyphen ages. Middle hyphen ages. To, <laughs> to sign up and receive $50 off your device. And Mike will. Fuck you. Middle hyphen <laughs> your ages. Yes, thank you, Soberlink. So sponsored by Soberlink. Soberlink. RNA, sponsored by Soberlink. That's right. And tell us your Soberlink story. If you have one. Did, do you, did you get a Soberlink out there in Munsterland? If you did, write us. Tell us what your experience was. We know that G-Money Smooth had a great experience, and he's talked about that on the show. <laughs> great experience. It was like, the best thing that ever you, happened. Like a great experience. I mean, every time we talked to him about it, he was glowing with love. <laughs> he was like, this was it. But really, he said he really got accustomed to using it and relying on it, even long after he was compelled to do so. I think... If you're using a Soberlink device, yeah. the, the term great experience is not something you've custom. <laughs> Why not? Why I mean, can't we maybe make your, Maybe your life isn't such a great experience at the moment. <laughs> and this is one of the best. I mean, if you're in a rut and you're, you've you got to do this anyway, you might as well do it in style with Soberlink. Right. It fits in your pocket. You it's can. Not, it's not just some breathalyzer you, you buy put, off the shelf. You can't buy it off the shelf. You can even use it in front of your kids. <laughs> <laughs> that was last year's copy. Oh. I guess they... they I liked it. Didn't like that one. Anymore. I liked it. I liked it. So Soberlink, yeah. middle hyphen, ages. Thank you, Soberlink. So um, so last weekend, so first of all, let me just say, this wait, time. Wait, wait. What? Wait, wait, before oh, you go. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, we're, and we're back. Welcome to Recovery in the Middle Ages, the podcast about two middle-aged suburban dads in the pursuit of life, love, and recovery. I'm Nat X. I'm Mike R. And boy, do we have a show for you. Boy, boy. Today on RMA, the great Suki Jones, author of Sea Swallow Me, joins us to discuss her book, her work, and her life. All this and more today on a very special edition of RMA. And welcome back. Can you finish your thought that I so rudely interrupted you? Well, no. I mean, this is what you're supposed to do. Right. I read the thing. I know. I forgot. Okay. Uh, the thought. I have a couple of thoughts. Mm. Let me talk about the first thought I have. Yes. Uh, I went to a funeral last weekend. Oh. And weirdly enough, I was listening to Dopey last weekend. And Dave said that he he went to a friend's fiance's or something, brother-in-law's funeral mm. of a old guy who was from a big Irish family. And I too went to a wake uh, of a guy that I knew who was a friend of mine's dad who passed away. Big Irish family. I wonder if Dave and I were at the same wake. Imagine. Wouldn't that be weird? It's possible. Anyway, um, so I, it's always very strange for me when, when hands reach out of the past and tap me on the shoulder. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so this was a friend of mine who I kind of grew up with out here. And then we ended up at the same college. And she... Um, you know, she's a professor at a college now out in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, our lives took different trajectories, but went went fairly well. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we stayed in touch. And, and every year or so, she has a big blowout out at her, out at her compound out there in Pennsylvania. Oh. And so I have gone in the past. I, I've kind of skipped the last couple of years because it really is just sort of a mostly a drunken bacchanal. And I... Well, I like to see everybody. I kind of like, I'd get bored and you know, I just kind of blow it off. But anyway, it was good to see her at the wake. Unfortunately, it was her father who died. Oh, so yeah, that was yeah. not so good. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, a couple of days before the funeral, I get a call out of the blue from a, a woman who I went to college with who is asking if she could stay at the house for the funeral. And, you know, I had to think a second about that because this is a person that knew me back when times were 
Different. Yeah, different, <laughs> to say the least. You know, when I was really an active rager of a of a of a druggie and you know oh, drunk wow. and stuff like that. So and, she knew the old bike. But I was like, yeah, we've ca- kind of kept up on Facebook, and she lives down in in Maryland, and you know, a nice family, uh, and so on. But you know. In the back of your mind, you're like, well, what's going to happen? Is she going to show up and is she going to want to like sort of relive the glory days of being back at school? And, you know, is it going to be a big like drink fest? Is there going to be like drugs and all this stuff? And all of this sort of script I'm writing in my head. And but, you know, I I immediately, you know, I I just cleared it with Aaron and I was like, yes, of course, you can come and stay, you know, Um you know, if you don't mind being barked at for two (laughs) solid days by my asshole dogs. Damn dogs. Um so she, I didn't really know what to expect. I pick her up at the train station. I drive back here and, you know, it's very chill. All of a sudden, we are two adults in our 50s who are not the way we were Isn't 40 that, years ago. What, is, what an amazing thing, right? That's interesting. Yeah, we go out to eat and, um, you know, she orders a glass of wine and my wife has a glass of wine and then that's it, you know. They had a glass of wine that was and it. she's like, yeah, I haven't had a drink in like, uh, I don't know, six months, whatever. She's like, I just don't like it. It just gives me a headache, you know, but she does smoke a lot of weed. Ah, um, yes, that's, that is and a you know, yeah, it is. A, it's a thing. And you know, she mostly takes edibles to sleep mm. because, um, she has insomnia and she knows these weed farmers and she goes to their house mm. and makes the edibles with them. Oh. Sort of like a farm to table sort of yes. sort of weed thing, right. if you will. Interesting. So um so okay, so we have a nice chat. We all go to bed early, like nine thirty, ten o'clock, because you know, we're old. And the next day I get up, I I you know, uh, Aaron has to take Ben to, to something at the high at a high school. Uh so I go to the funeral with my friend. And we're sitting in the car and because we got there a little early and it was five degrees out and she's telling me more about the edibles and I'm kind of, yeah, okay. You know, and, and then she's like, well, do you want one? And uh, I'm like, well, I don't know. I'm like, I said, yes. <laughs> You're just being polite, right? I was kind of being polite, you know, because I, you know me, I don't, I'm not like a big pot guy, whatever. But anyway, she, so she gives me this caramel and, and it's like. She's like, it's 50 milligrams. You should probably just nibble at the corner. Mm. And I'm like, oh, okay, thanks. I, I put it in the in the, the thing in my car, like in the middle of the hump there, mm. where it still is right now. I'm just driving around with this 50 milligram weed oh, gummy Jesus. in the car. But, uh, you know, I was kind of curious. As, you know, later on, I started second guessing myself about why did I say yes? Did I really have any intention of, of taking, of nibbling at this weed gummy? Mm. Like I haven't, I don't really have trouble sleeping. Uh, I don't have any real need to to have a weed gummy around but so there it sits and yeah. then the funny the postscript is the funny thing is like another friend that i knew from college came out for the funeral also on the train and and we kind of decamped to a starbucks after the funeral before the the reception thingy hmm. uh, which i ended up not going to but um my friend was like hey do you want to smoke a joint and I'm like, I definitely do not want to smoke a joint. No. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, though. Isn't it weird? It's all like we're teenagers again because now it's yeah. legal. So everyone who used to be like, a, it's a, weird. A lot of people in their in their 50s, all these Gen X folks are, are like smoking weed. Like it's, you well, know, because it's easier. It's easier on the body, I guess. Yeah. You know? And it was like such a forbidden fruit when we were kids and teenagers, at least, you know, yeah. it was such a big deal. And you remember there was like when an artist or, um, or a musician would come out and be like, legalize it. Yeah, like, yeah, this yeah. was like a rally cry to the rebels out there. Like, you know, nuts to the system. Right. Pot. Nuts. Make things out of hemp. <laughs> I remember going to Lollapalooza in 1994, and it was very popular. Everything was, this is made of hemp. And look at this thing I sewed out of hemp. And somehow that was like a middle finger to uh, the system. And now the system is, you know, packaging, branding, and selling you whilst charging taxes. Yes. Everybody's getting rich off it. The government, everybody. The rebellion is over, guys. This is is like a role playing now. Yeah. Just another uh, corporate shill. Yeah, it was weird. I was like, you know, I guess I could I could smoke this joint and then go to the open house at my son's high school. 
<laughs> I can't even you know, imagine. You play the tape forward and you're like, eh, nope. Why would I? On Saturday afternoon, I'm going to smoke pot and then go do this thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of a, it's a slippery slope. Um, is it though? It is. See, that's I, what everybody says, that weed is the gateway drug. The, well, I don't know if it's a gate. Yeah, I mean, we think it's a gateway or I do. Uh, I was you ta- do? I, I mean, <laughs> the way it used to be, it certainly was because where did you, where did I buy marijuana or weed if i wanted it you're going to a drug dealer drug dealers typically lead to other drug dealers um or like meeting a dangerous felon isn't uh as safe as going to buy your weed in farmingdale from the dispensary Mm. you know what i mean so Mm -hmm. it sort of keeps you out of that that criminal element Mm. Uh, and i think that could have been the gateway but now that it's totally above board basically it's like um Maybe it's not as gateway as it used to be. It's sort of redefining what, what it, what's meant by a gateway, I think. Right. I think the, the idea of the gateway is like if you start smoking pot, you're going to you know wind up with a needle in your arm shortly thereafter. Um, I think maybe it was a pattern of behavior that was, would be the beginning of developing. So like right. it just maybe. But that, if we didn't exist, you probably would have ended up with, at the right. heroin anyway. It was just the lowest hanging fruit for someone yeah. who wants to you know, use drugs or, or all of that. Yeah. I'm hearing a lot about my partner. My business partner is a clinical psychologist. And sometimes he tells me about, you know, anonymously, of course, he doesn't no names or anything. Um, some of his, uh, the intakes or the, or the sessions that he has interesting things come up. And one of them is he says he's getting a lot more, uh, people who, uh, they're treating smoking pot or taking edibles like it's completely benign yeah. and then acting totally confused when they're fighting depression all of a sudden <laughs> or they've lost their motivation all of a sudden. <laughs> and he's like, it's funny. He goes, they really – and he's not like sober. He do, He's not against responsible use of THC, but he says he's noticing a pattern in his patients that they're smoking more or they're taking more and it's having – a negative effect yeah. on their daily life. But because they've been, you know, so like brainwashed to believe like this is nothing. It's just like a glass of wine, you know, right. no big deal. He's like, it's just not true. Like from a clinical perspective, this is a psychoactive substance mm-hmm. and it does have effects that have a rebound effect, uh, side effects and they have withdrawal and it changes your brain. And so people are just, they, that's the one thing that's really, um, you know, strange to see is the total flip. It's not just okay responsibly. This is something you can take for anything. Right. Like a miracle cure. Right. Right. Well, you know, uh, I think pot is a victim of its own success. I mean, for so many years, people were touting mm-hmm. it as uh, the miracle drug that could cure everything from right. uh, epilepsy to narcolepsy to, uh, to cancer to whatever. Yeah. And, you know, people have sort of gotten high off their own supply like they're starting to believe all of the stuff that really had very slim basis in fact and you know we because it was a schedule one it was wasn't really tested because the theory was it had no medical usage right that's why it was schedule one so there was no money to do tests on on cannabis and now all the money that's pouring into testing cannabis they're finding out that it's not such a benign um you know everybody grandma should take you know, do some bong rips on a Sunday afternoon, uh, kind of a deal. Um, if I, if I was going, if we were going to do a recovery in the news this week, which we're not, (laughs) yeah, like a, it's like a Pavlovian reaction. I hit the button and and you go, yeah. (laughs) Anyway, if we were to do one this week, which we are not because we were having a guest, I would do it on an article that came up, uh, in the New York times this past week, which basically, um, compared and contrasted uh, pot, uh, um, smoking cannabis with taking an edible and and trying to determine which one was sort of better for you. Pot or... or an edible or smoking. I, yeah, my theory is... Well, I'll tell you. What's your theory? My theory is if you're inhaling a combustible... When they call that, you know, like when you use combustion to change the chemical composition of anything and inhale it, that's where it produces toxins. Um, so that's why they say like vaping things is better because you're not lighting it on fire and then inhaling it. So I think edibles should be better. Well, the New York Times uh, article is, are edibles safer than smoking? Uh, and it says the health risks uh, risks of cannabis depend in part on how you, you know what? Fuck it. Let's just do it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Recovery in the news. Recovery in the news. 
Recovery. <laughs> Recovery in the news, motherfucker. Better early than never. Um, so this week, the New York Times uh, put out the aforementioned article, Are Edibles Safer Than Smoking? Uh, and they talk about how cannabis-infused chocolate fountains are flowing at weddings, bud tenders are pouring cannabis cocktails, and as sales of edibles are trending up, cannabis brands are emphasizing the idea that the products may offer a healthier alternative to bongs or blunts. Edibles allow you to enjoy cannabis without the negative side effects of smoking, reads the website of Kiva, which makes cannabis chocolate bars and flute flute. <laughs> what are flute flavored gummies? Flute flavored gummies. Uh, and consumers are increasingly asking whether that's the case, but the answer is complicated. There's little research comparing the health effects of edibles and smoking head to head. Uh, what we do know so far comes from anecdotes, limited data, and uh, inferences from researchers and clinicians. Um, the problem with edibles, of course, is that they're very hard to dose. As my friend said, a nibble on the corner of this one. Now, this is somebody who's been smoking pot for 40 years. Maybe a nibble on the corner is what she perceives would be enough for me, but that might send me to the floor for like three days, like that Delta 8 gummy that you uh, slipped yeah. me back way back when. That wasn't even real THC, and it knocked you out. It knocked me out, but I mean, you... You can be out for hours and days even if you eat too much of this stuff. If you have an extra bite of a pot brownie, uh, it's just you could have paranoia, delusions, panic attacks. Yeah. You know, rapid racing heartbeats, which is why emergency rooms are experiencing a huge yeah. uh, influx of people that eat too many pot brownies and are convinced they're having a heart attack. All these, all these Gen X guys in their 50s are yeah, like, yeah. fuck, I'm having a heart attack from weed. Yeah, yeah it's dangerous. <laughs> Um, so, um, a lot of people take them safely, but, um, you also can get a more intense high because of how the body metabolize, metabolizes THC. Um, so for some people that high can be pleasant and for others, fear and anxiety can take hold. Um, yeah. So, and of course, smoking, you have the respiratory effects, you know, but you, you can typically, um, get an idea what your dosage is going to be if you're smoking better than if you're just eating some edible and you don't know how it's made or what's in it or all this stuff. Well, I mean, how about just not doing any weed yeah. cannabis at all? Yeah. <laughs> right. It scares that? me like the homemade stuff. Um, when I hear about that, how can they possibly know how to measure doses? How do they know it's 50 milligrams? Mm. Same way when I used to brew beer with my dad and when I was in college, I had no idea how to like control how much alcohol. I mean, yeah, we that's because we were bad at it. But like, think of that. But with weed, you know, we used to like randomly go, um, all right, if we put more sugar, I think that means more alcohol. But like sometimes the beer would be totally. So were you like dumping five pounds of sugar? In we there? just like <laughs> we had no idea what we were doing. It wasn't even we're like you know measuring it, and we had it was sometimes it was great, sometimes it was really alcoholic, sometimes it was like non-alcoholic, but. Did you have a name for it? Did you print up labels? Did you call it like Kingsley Lager or something? You know, my brother had like uh, labels printed up at some point. This is like 20 years ago now. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like a thing with uh, me, my dad, my brother. Hmm. Uh, and we had, we would, my dad would save the old bottles from drinking them and we'd wash the labels off. Hmm. And then we put the Kingsley one on. Kingsley. Did you did it have like a, a crest? <laughs> I don't remember. You know, I, I got to find one of those. I, I don't think I got a crest on it. I didn't design it, so yeah. I would have put a crest on it. I think yeah. that looks good. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, but with weed, I mean, if you accidentally dose like 100 milligrams and the person, you know, that could that could be really dangerous. Yeah. So I'm. So what do I do with this weed gummy? Should uh, I add it to the two weed gummies that the bud tender at that sketchy Delta 8 store gave me as samples that I've been sitting in my closet for two years? Where are your... AA sponsor, I would say, throw it away. The only reason you're keeping it is because you have a reservation about one day eating it, and that's bad. Yeah, but aren't we supposed to go one day at a time? Yeah, we are. So if we're supposed to do that, who cares what happens in well, the future? You protect your tomorrow by making sure you don't have the option. Yeah, maybe. I, a weird postscript to that is, you know, uh, my, son went, my other son went back to college, you know, a week ago, two weeks ago. Mm. And uh, we were laughing about 
laughing about it. Because when I first quit, one of the main reasons I did is because he was starting to get into to drugs and stuff. And um, I felt like I would have no credibility if I was still drinking and smoking pot. But um, he found my weed, remember, in yep. the safe and all this stuff. And so I had, to, I had to take the weed that I had and hide it in the garage. Remember this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you still have it there? Well, I stumbled upon I was cleaning up. This I was is putting why the Christmas decorations away, and I, and I thought that I had thrown it away, but apparently I hadn't. It was still sitting up there. So now I have this bag of bud from a dispensary in Massachusetts that's four and a half years old. Oh. And it's just in a bag. And yeah, just, like why keep it? I don't know. An emergency or... Yeah. It's what happens weird... if society breaks down? Um, I, I'll tell you, there's a dark side to this, this way of thinking. Um, that I experienced. So as, as I mentioned on a previous show, January uh, 4th was the anniversary of the OD, yes. the event. <clears throat> and I don't know if I, if I told this part of the story. I think I did originally. Um, <clears throat> so what ended up killing me was little bags of fentanyl that right. were uh, mislabeled, you could say. It was supposed to be <laughs> just regular Deceptive advertising. heroin, right? Um, so I had 10 of these little, I guess they were a 10th. The whole thing was a bundle, which is 10, uh, little bags. So two of those were what killed me. And then there was eight left over. Mm-hmm. And I remember I, I hadn't like before I had died, so to speak, I had like hidden those mm. somewhere in the store. And after everything happened, um, of course that wasn't the first thing in my mind miraculously cause I was so out of it. But um, one ha- once I had gotten back to work and I was back in my shop, I was cleaning up in the back, and I found right. those. Uh, s- I found six or seven of them. In other words, the cops or the nobody had found them and removed them. And for a period of time, I remember looking at them. Even after my right arm was really didn't work, I had these horrific consequences legally, and just in every sense of the word. And for some reason, I took them and I said, you know what? And I put them and I said, just in case, Uh just in case. And I put them on the top shelf in the closet. And I basically forgot about them because I had a lot to deal with. And until, I don't know, I got like, I finally stopped uh, everything on the 18th. But there was a weeks had gone by, and I was started to think about them. One mm. time, I looked at it, and I started thinking, "Look, what? Why am I keeping this? This is going to kill me!" Like, and I, I came up with all these end of the world scenarios. I was like, "Well, this is a really powerful substance. This is like <laughs> what happens." I if, could treat people who well, are like, hurt with this. You know, I could, I could anesthetize people's pain. Right? What? What if <laughs> the, the world falls apart? Zombies are everywhere. <laughs> And I'm with one of these like local, you know, militias and somebody gets shot and hey, who's got a painkiller? Yeah. Hey, I still have some fentanyl from <laughs> from the before four times, you know. When, when I was part of, but I was really having these conversations with myself until one day I was like I took them, I put them in the toilet and flushed them, and that's that was like a moment where I was like this is ridiculous yeah. and I actually made a logical choice. So I get it. You we do that I think with you know, with like you thinking, well, what if one day I really, really need this? Yeah. And it's not that easy to get, you know. So I mean, It's absurd when you look at it that yeah. way, right? I mean, the world's not going to end. And if it does, I'm not going to need cannabis, right? Right. <laughs> I mean, Probably. So. Or if uh, something horrible happens, you're like, this is it. I'm just checking out. Yeah. I just. You can always grab a bottle of whiskey for that. You know, you hang on. Well, I mean, that stuff has like current, like you can use booze as currency after, after yeah. everything falls apart. Which should be probably next November. That's the thing. I'm going to hold on to the weed until after the next presidential election. At the very least. And then I'm going to get rid of it. And pick up some cartons of cigarettes because, you know, everybody knows in jail at least. (laughs) You can trade them for anything. If you want more soups or honey buns. cigarettes for food, that's that's messed up. Yeah. There's a guy in cell block C that makes amazing lean. It's just a a jailhouse. Oh, yeah. I heard about this stuff. Yeah. Or Pruno. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Made with raisins and Yeah. So you can trade commissary. Yeah. You can trade your um bottles of whiskey or cartons of Newport cigarettes and get yourself. Why do they have to be Newports? Because those are the best ones. Those were worth the most in rehab. We used to call them uh in the Bronx when we smoked and we were in between hits of crack. You'd be like, Hey uh, hey man, you got a you got a chest breaker? We used to call them chest breakers. Because <laughs> it hurt. Yeah. Um yeah, so hang on to those. Yeah. In rehab 
the you, there were different kinds of cigarettes that had different prices. Some guys would have a bag of what they called Lucy's, right? Which were sure. loose cigarettes yeah. they would get from the Indian reservation, right? Native you American buy those reservation. at the bodega, in right? The Bronx. Yeah. And then some people had the foresight. It wasn't their first time in rehab, and they would bring cartons of mm. Newports. And man, tw- those went for twenty bucks uh, a pack. Now that doesn't Back sound then. like much. Today, because that's what you probably pay, but yeah, that was at least a four hundred percent markup. Yeah, and um, yeah, when we uh, when I me and my friend helped uh, this guy Jay um, rob the bodega in the Bronx, we got paid with a carton of cigarettes, a carton of Newports. It was like the best thing ever. Oh my god, I started uh, to like Newports. Yeah, well, they, there was that little extra something you got, like the minty fresh breath. Yeah, from <laughs> give you that extra kick. <laughs> yeah. Um, Hey, we so we have Sookie Jones uh, set to come on in a video. Are we doing a video interview? Uh, yes. Well, we're zooming it, so I'm going to record the zoom. Um, I wanted to to recognize some monsters because oh the great yes, Den Mom Melissa, who has so lovingly prepared. Um, she updated the, the thingy. The latest monster news. Mm-hmm. This is the latest, right? We didn't read this. Oh yes, look. Okay, we've got sober versaries from the monster verse to read. Excellent. Um, do we have your special music? Mm. Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, let's see. Recovery in the Middle Ages would like to recognize the following monsters for their dedication, hard work, and inspiring sobriety. Here we go. Chris M. with five years. Yay! Congratulations, Chris. The great Julie Keys. Gets three months sober. Nice. Congratulations. Yes, She's been telling us all about her journey on, on the Discord. Ryan M. With two years. All right. Congratulations, Ryan. Woo! That is a huge, <laughs> huge milestone. Yeah. Um, Kristen S. With one year. All right. Congratulations. That one year to me was always the biggest goal. Yes. I mean, every day is a goal and something to celebrate. But for some reason, that one year... That was the hardest thing for me to get. So congratulations. 100%. Congratulations. And finally, Melissa K., who I think is the very dead yes. mother of which we speak, has one year. Congratulations All to the right. dead mom. Congratulations, Monk. Congratulations, guys. You're it's, an inspiration. It is a huge accomplishment to put together any time. Yeah. Especially these long times. It's, it's amazing. And, you know, for somebody that's really been struggling, putting together two days, a week, 24 hours mm-hmm. should be celebrated because it's hard and you did it. Yeah. And, and it's worth acknowledging. And there's something about a collective group of people like reaching milestones like this and celebrating it together that just helps push it forward. Yeah. So there's monsters out there if you guys are still struggling. And it's great to see um, people posting support posts on the Recovery in the Middle Ages Facebook group, um, celebrating two days, three days. Um, every day is a celebration. So come on board and, and keep recovering with us. Thank you guys um, for hanging out with us. Uh, I would also just like to maybe have a moment of silence uh, and acknowledgement uh, of G Money's uh, cat, Percy, mm. who had yeah. to be uh, sent over the Rainbow Bridge. Yeah. This week, he uh, was 13 years old. His natural cause is just to be clear, this yeah. isn't some kind yeah, of yeah, yeah, salacious. Yeah. No, uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ, Matt. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, <laughs> he was a good cat. Yeah. Right? Well, I commiserate with cat owners, too. Yeah. I, I have a cat. That's hard. My, my cat uh, died at age 13 also, um, mm. you know, years ago when I lived in Staten Island. And uh, when he died, I uh, died my arms. It was very sad. And I was really broken up because that cat and I were like buddies, you know? So you're a cat guy. Yeah. Ultimately Me under, too. under the skin, I'm a cat guy. But, but I, after he died, his name was Vegas because I named him after Las Vegas, yeah. one of my favorite cities at the time. Um, <laughs> I put him in a box and then I put the box under my arm and slung a shovel over my shoulder and then walked into the woods on Staten Island to bury the, bury the cat. Wow. And I'm like, I wonder what, what this, this is probably, like? this is probably not an uncommon scene on Staten Island. People walking into the woods, <laughs> burying bodies with a shovel, you know, he said, that's just Tony. <laughs> Like, oh, what's that guy doing? Hey, I buried Gino over there. I hope he doesn't dig to, to the right of that tree. No, no, Gino's a tabby. Don't worry. Yeah, we're going to have to fuck that guy up. So, um, yeah, I, I, I feel for you, Grant. Yeah. Man. I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry to hear that. Well, condolences to you and the family. 
Yeah, I've got a cat now, and all I can think about is the little tragedy I have waiting for me in the next 10 years or so. <laughs> Shit, dude. That's all that's, I... That's, you know... Isn't that horrible? That's like, you're right in that future, you're future tripping, yeah, man. I am. So I'm, I'm You enjoy. can think the same thing about your wife, your kids, your parents. Well, I mean, no, the uh, thing with pets... Everybody's going to die. But like with pets, if all goes according to plan, you'll outlive your pet. Yeah. The only time you don't outlive your pet is if, as if something horrible basically happens to you, or you're very old and sick. Right. So the way I think, yeah, my catastrophic thinking, the minute we get an animal, I'm like, I just bought a uh, future crisis. You know, <laughs> like this is just going to be <laughs> pain, well, which is why I haven't gotten another dog. But, yeah, it is very sad to become. Life is suffering, man. Yeah. Suffering is caused by attachment. There is the three rings of marriage. The... Wedding ring, the engagement ring, and the suffering. <laughs> oh. Yes. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> so what's been going on in your life? Um, you know, we've got some time to talk about what's been happening, what we've been up to. I know that there's been some things going on, uh, looking at schools with college. Oh. Fuck, um, we had midterms recently. I don't know why it's a midterm at, uh, at in the eighth grade when it's like the end of the term or is it the uh, middle of the what? year? I can't understand. H- hence the reason that we're looking at at high schools for Ben that are not this one. Yeah. Because I think uh, the leadership in this district is completely fucked. I, I don't see anything getting better anytime soon. Yeah, it's a bit of a shit show and it's not much better at uh, other local schools. Um I haven't heard a lot about drugs. Um, no, you know, luckily, yet. but uh, you know, you do hear some vaping in the bathroom. Yeah, vaping in the bathroom, and um, but overall, yeah, it's distressing. But what does Ben think about it? Is he look at his brother where he goes to school and want to follow in his footsteps? Well, he got accepted to that school. Yeah, um, which was we didn't expect um, because you know Ben has a different sort of. Um, skill set than Jack in terms of like just hardcore academics. But uh, we, so we visited Chaminade. We took, checked it out, kicked the tires. And I don't think Ben was impressed. I don't think he wanted, he, as he put it to me, he's like, I really don't want to work that hard. And I was like, <laughs> I get it, man. I totally get it. Yeah. So we took him over to Kellenberg, which is basically Chaminade light. It's like the same That's a pretty tough school too. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's co-ed. Mm. It's more relaxed. The, it's the same group of, brothers the Marianist brothers mm-hmm. that run both schools but they're run consciously in a different way like kellenberg is run as a kinder gentler version of shamanat which is basically oh. a pressure cooker so there's like there's fish tanks there's animals there's dogs walking around the oh. campus you know there's like activities for him to do after school you know it's just it's not so hyper focused on academics and and ben is not hyper focused on academics so it's like it's i think it's going to be a good fit but we we of course, we struggle with the tension between taking him out of, you know, this environment. Mm. You know, I mean, my, you know, my wife is a public school all the way and right, supports public too. school all the way. It's just, uh, you know. You have to really need a change. Um, the one thing I always think about to uh, bring it back to recovery, because this is a big something we've been dealing with, you know, since we had kids. It's where is the best possible place for a kid when it comes to avoiding the, the drug element of right. drinking. And it's not as simple. It used to be the thought was they go to private school, they get away from that stuff. You're yeah. away from the riffraff. Now, I know for a fact That's that it's not, not how it works. Right. And so I think, I mean, do you think there is more risk at these private schools or is a child at risk no matter where he or she goes? And you just have to prepare them to hopefully make good decisions and, uh, and hope for the best. I think you should do that regardless of where they're going to school, prepare them to make good decisions. I think I think that in a school environment like a Chaminade or a Kellenberg or some of these Catholic schools, um, I wouldn't... I think that if you get caught doing something there, you are... They, they toss you out pretty yeah. quickly mm-hmm. so that in a public school, that's not necessarily the case. There's so not the really, culture yeah. is, is different. Like You're actually afraid of being thrown out, or that's a real fear, yeah, whereas in well, public it, school, they won't. Right, and if they find somebody dealing drugs, whatever, and they know about it, well, you're gone, and that's it. You're gone. Yeah. 
Um, you know, which means that maybe there's less of that stuff to worry about at a parochial school. Although I bought my first couple of joints at Chaminade, like when I was 17 from a student who was sitting right in front of me. So it, of course it's there. Well, you know? yeah. Like when I left public school in the ninth grade, um, I hadn't really even seen pot yet. Um, I went away to school and I very quickly discovered that LSD was going around. And when I would visit home and I would tell my friends, oh, man, have you tried acid? They're like, are you fucking crazy? Acid? What the hell? They were just drinking beer and smoking some pot, you know, uh, going to heavy metal shows. And here I come back, like, tripping. So it's just a dip. Hey, folks, sorry. We had a, uh audio issue. Lost about five minutes of Nat and I continuing to bullshit. Uh, I assure you, you didn't miss anything of any great import. So we're going to take a quick break and be right back after these words. And we're back. We're back. Hello. Hi. Hello. So we're still T minus uh, ten minutes to Suki, but I, f- I figured in our virtual reality, mm. like when you listen to this, it won't be ten minutes between now and when we start talking to Suki. Right, right, right. Well, at least I don't think. Anyway, it'll seem like instantaneous. So Suki's book came out last June, twenty twenty three, I think, uh, and it's a well in this dark, harrowing, and gripping memoir which details a drug addiction that almost killed her. Suki Jones writes with a raw immediacy and refreshing candor about not only being dependent on drugs, but keeping that dependency a secret from her family and friends. Set against the backdrop of the Bay Area in the early 90s, Jones balances motherhood and modeling with deft precision, but behind the scenes, she was falling apart and roaming the night with... Who writes this stuff? (laughs) With punk rockers, metalheads, and sometimes even strangers just looking for her next fix. Very cinematic. It is. I heard the book was cinematic. A ferocious memoir about broken family history, sexual abuse, and debilitating addiction. See, swallow me. See, swallow me. We have to ask exactly. How do you, which emphasis on which syllable? Uh, It vividly wanders through the decade with a fiery resolve, which ultimately reveals how Jones survived when she shouldn't have. See, swallow me. <laughs> See, swallow me. Swallow me is a powerful and redemptive tale of really resilience. I fucked it up with resilience and ultimately redemption. Redemption. Thank how you. it is, how it was, and I, I actually really enjoyed this book. Um, I got to meet Suki at DopeyCon. Yeah. So it was cool because um, she had a table there and she was meeting and greeting fans and and telling people about the book. She and, just sat behind the table and was yeah. like, hi, I'm Suki Jones. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I met cool. her and she she knew about the show and I knew about her from, you know, from Dopey and stuff. And um, it was really cool. And she was excited to do the show. Um, and it just took us some time to get our, our shit together. Yes. Well, and, she was. Uh, she came to the uh, Munster West. Yeah, it's so cool. We went hiking in, uh, in Muir Woods. So, yeah. So, yeah. Suki is... In the Monsterverse, and I think you guys would really enjoy this book. It's a good read. It's a fast read. It's exciting. It moves. It's yes. poetic. Yeah. And um, it's a true uh, story of how it is, how it was, and how it could possibly be. Or what is it? Experience, strength, hope, redemption, recovery. The hero's journey. The hero's journey. Once again, I'm yeah. beating that dead horse. All right. So hang on, folks. I'm going to get the... I'm going to get the Zoom working, and uh, yeah, and then... We are going to do our best. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. Hang yes. on. Recording in progress. Suki! Suki! Can you hear us? I think you are muted. Oh. We want to hear you. <laughs> Yay. Ta-da! Thank hey. you. Hey, listen, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to apologize for getting you up so early. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Apology accepted. It's uh, it's weird because I I deal with a lot of like for work I deal with a lot of California folks, and it's always the other side that I have to de- like I have to like get on calls at eight o'clock at night and right. it annoys me. So I imagine it annoys you to get on a call at seven o'clock in the morning. So <laughs> it's it's okay. It comes with the territory. I'll, I'll survive. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for uh, agreeing to uh, to come on and talk to us. Uh, 
I finished your book, what, two days ago. As we were texting to set up this interview, I finished it. So it's, wow. it's somewhat fresh. Quite a, quite a harrowing tale. A dark, harrowing, yeah. and, and gripping memoir. Harrowing. I had trouble saying harrowing. I was trying to read it out loud, and I kept saying heralding. It's dark, harrowing. It's a tricky one. Harrowing. It, it is tricky. Right. You could say heralding, I guess. Heralding. I mean, I if, you, make... if you wanted, you could, you could say that. In this dark, heralding, and gripping memoir. Yeah, I guess it works. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, quite a, quite a story. Um, yeah, sorry it took me so long to set this up. We got to run into each other at DopeyCon, which was really cool. And yeah. um, and then I was like, oh, we got to get Sookie on the show. And, I, you know, life just blew up, and I completely lost my focus. And uh, But I'm glad that we finally got it together to, to get you yes. on. Yes. Yeah. It's good to connect. So uh, I just I finished your book, and then I was listening to Mark Marin uh, yesterday interviewing somebody, and he had a quote in there that just kind of hit me upside of the head, and and kind of really resonated with me with 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 uh, reflection to your book. It was uh, he said the monster I built to protect the child inside of me is hard to manage. Mm. Oh, I like that. Deep, right? So. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So uh, that's a good quote. I it like is. It. It's very accurate. <laughs> it is. It is because yeah. you know, uh, certainly in in my case and and Matt's case, the monster got really hard to manage. Yeah, after- <laughs> and, and that's that's a really interesting point that kind of goes through this the whole theme of the book and kind of everything we've been sort of exploring on the show. We've been doing a lot of like on this show, we do a lot of question asking. And sort of exploring and trying to find out out loud, you know, what we really believe or, or what's true. And one of the, the things we keep coming back to, and I think for good reason, is adverse childhood experiences. And when we're talking about our own stories or someone else's, like I inevitably look at the childhood, even if it's not 100% the main reason, it, it's been so important, you know, understanding how that monster was created or how did we cultivate the very thing that's destroying us, that's sort of part of us. And, and I think, yeah. so, yeah, your book really, like, brings that to light, you know, really uh, painting the picture of how the uh, the childhood connects to some of the struggles you had. Yes. Yeah, it definitely was, you know, like, a, a, a reason that I drank and used over. You know, I think you can't, I can't really separate the two. And I think, like, whenever, when I share, like, 12 step meetings or, um, do public speaking. That's something I'm always, I always want to point out, like, I always want to share my background, like from childhood, because it's, it's, if you skip over like childhood and you're just like, Oh, I was, you know, I was an opiate addict. (laughs) You're, you're missing out on like, you know, there's all these details that like led up to it, like how I got there. And I think it's really important, you know, even like my dad's, alcoholism right like that's important in my story because it it you know cultivated the the addict that i became you know so, yeah it's, it's like a fine yeah. line we walk and you hear this in the rooms or with other speakers where we want to say you know i'm not blaming my childhood I, you, i'm trying to i know that when i was doing the work in uh in rehab and and for the last you know the years after i got sober a lot of it was taking responsibility for where we find ourselves while also acknowledging the things that may have contributed to it. So it's kind of like, it's, it's a fine line that we walk. I think, you know, not blaming our parents or blaming our childhood still, but acknowledging how that might have shaped the way we're now like coping with, with life. Absolutely. Yeah. I would totally agree with that. So when you sat down, when did you write the book? Because it came out, what, last year? It, so, it's almost a year old. It came out at the end of February in 2023. So did you write it just before? Or is this something that you've been working on for it a longer period of time? It has been in the works for so long. Yeah. <laughs> like, it, it was like a ridiculous amount of time. Like, where I, I, you know, would, like, work on it for a little while. I mean, like, at least, like at least a decade, a little more than a decade. For sure. Wow. wow. Um, because it was something where, you know, like I would work on it and like kind of be like, you know, steadily working on it and like forming it. And and then, you know, I would, you know, 
life would get in the way or like what you know something or or i would get to the hard parts you know like i would mm. start writing about like being sexually molested you know or or just things that were or even you know like with my dad and my stepmother like things things that were hard to to write about because i had to revisit them in detail and so um i would put it away for a while and it was my kids that were like you should finish your book Oh wow! And during the pandemic, like they both my kids were like, "You need to, you need to write your story," and I was like, "Damn it!" <laughs> yeah, now now I have the time. Yeah, now nothing I, else yes, is happening yeah. in the world. Yeah. Now they always tell us in recovery, one of the first things that they told us to do, told me to do in rehab, that I absolutely had so much trouble doing was journal, right? Like they would always tell right. us, you know, you have to take, keep a journal every day, and how cathartic and therapeutic it is. But how different is that when basically this was like journaling, except now you're sharing it with yeah, whomever, yeah. you know, it has your name yeah. on it. It's not anonymous. It's this, yes. you know, really helpful, yeah. you know, it's a harrowing tale, right? But how does that <laughs> change how it is helps you? Does it make, is it more helpful now, like sharing it? Or how does that make you feel putting all of that uh, private journaling basically out there? It's, I mean, it, it does make you feel vulnerable and like, you're, you know, like I'm, you're like, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna put it all out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I had a lot of, I've always written like all my life. So I had a lot of, um, and a lot of actual journals, like spiral bound notebooks that were, you know, 25 oh, or wow. 35, you know, like really old notebooks that I actually like pulled out and went through napkins scraps of paper post-its like stuck into journals and um so yeah so it was kind of like uh it it was there was a process of like going through those and then trying to translate that onto paper so that it mm. was like a cohesive linear <laughs> story mm. instead of just all these random notes but um yeah i'm a big fan of journaling i like i like the, that process a lot so you you uh, you kept a diary when you were when you were younger. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you were writing, when you sat down to write the book, was was that the first time that you looked back on some of the stuff that you'd written a long time ago, or have you always had this sort of percolating up in your consciousness? And you know, this was just you getting it out on paper. It, I had looked back, like I had read through things, but again, like sometimes, you know, like you'd start to read through it and you'd be like, oh, I just, ooh, that's a lot. Like yeah. that's a lot to read, you know? Um, and so, you know, like I would kind of close it up and like, I'll look at that again later. Um, I, I've done a lot of work like in therapy. So like those, mm -hmm. you know, the, the subjects that come up in the book, like I have worked through them and like worked with a therapist on. So e even if you've like been in therapy for, you know, like I've been in therapy since I was like 13. So um, you're, you're not, <laughs> you're not prepared when you, when you go into detail, like they're like, you think like, okay, like I can write this. It's going to be okay. Because like I've, I've dealt with these issues and I work with a therapist and you know, like you're, you you feel like you've healed and like moved past it. But when you're writing about it, it, it really like really opens up the scab right. and oh, like yeah. makes it because I, I was like for it to be um, authentic and for people to see themselves in it, like people that have had similar, you know, things in their life. I, I had to really, you know, detail it as much as possible. Yeah, so and it really that, that comes was off. hard. And it really comes off, you know, and the, the book is very poetic and descriptive, but in a way that you can feel by reading kind of, it, I'm not saying I, I can put myself in your shoes, of course, but like just to feel what you were feeling, you really, it really comes across in the way you wrote it. So I could imagine that in order to do that, you, you have to put yourself right back in that moment and how difficult that is. But yeah, I I think, um, you know, people who have also experienced that, it, that's why it's it's so important that you write a book like this and talk about it because lots of people have gone through these things and, and they wouldn't tell anyone. Yeah, yeah lots of people. Like, I'm surprised, I, I was actually, or am surprised still, like, at the amount of people that contact me or reach out to me about 
similar incidences within their life and thank me for talking about it. it it's important to talk about. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you're going back and you're you're revisiting memories of uh, sexual abuse and your, you know, and your and your father and his antics and so on. Like that must have taken quite an emotional toll uh, on on. How did you manage that? You know, as you were, um, as you were writing, mm. <laughs> I upped my therapy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Listen to, yeah, I mean, honestly, like I, um, I, I talked with like a lot of friends about it. I. And I, I truly like up my therapy. It was not, it wasn't easy to write about. It was that in particular, like writing about the sexual abuse was probably the hardest thing to write about. Mm, yeah. So, um, I mean, yeah. is that openness sort of like a natural part of, of your writing process or is it something you consciously had to, had to embrace and had to sort of get out yeah or you get right. used to it in 12 step too yeah Sorry right to but like but it's a little yeah. different you it's know? like you get in that mindset after being sober so long and, and how we're a little more comfortable like i used to say like like 12 step is sort of like the opposite of normal life where you're trying to keep things from people you meet in 12 step or in recovery meetings you immediately spit the skeleton <laughs> and you know out and it you know hits the wall and everyone sees it so i mean did that support your ability to like be putting this um out in a book yeah i think yeah i think so like definitely i think like just having the tools that i've learned in like both therapy and like 12 step were like invaluable right. <laughs> like in writing in writing this and like just having people that i knew i could talk to about i talked to my mom a lot about a lot of the aspects oh, wow. of the book like writing it which was, um, you know, that was hard. Like that was hard because, you know, like there were things like with my dad and like, you know, like that everything that went on between my mom and my dad and like revisiting that with her was hard too because I, it was painful memories for to mm -hmm. bring up with her. But, um, but she was, you know, it's funny because when I first started writing the book and I, I asked my mom, I said, do you want me to call you your actual name or do you want to be something else? And she was like, probably a pseudonym. So she mm. gave me the pseudonym that I use. Mm -hmm. And then when we, when I got finished with the book and we were reading back some of the parts in it together, she was like, I want to go by my actual name. Mm. And I, and that was like such an important moment for me because I was like, Wow, like my mom, like she she was like, I went through this and I want to own it yeah. and I want to, and it's important that like, like it was just it was it was really something cool to experience that she was like, Yeah, that's that happened to me. You it's know, like she's acknowledging it, you know, maybe somewhere yes. in the back of your subconscious part of you wants to believe maybe this stuff didn't really happen or maybe yeah. maybe you know, maybe it was a dream, even though you know, and then having her acknowledge that you know, having her say, I was there too, and it affected yes. me, and this is how um, I'm going to heal with you. It's, it's really beautiful. Yeah. yeah. It must have been uh, cathartic to go through that process with her of reading the book. I mean, did it did it improve your relationship or change your relationship with um, each other? I mean, we've, you know, like, you've read the book. <laughs> we, yeah. we, it's just her, it's been her and I, like, most of my life, you know, so, like, we're pretty, we're very close like i talk with her every day like multiple times and like see her multiple times a week and so like we're very close anyway but um it it just was like i think she she was really proud of me for writing it and that was that's a good feeling like you sure. always want your parents to be proud of you she was also like uh like <laughs> I was a great mom. Like my, oh, God. <laughs> my daughter was, you know, like she had those moments too. Like you were sexually assaulted, like, you know, uh, you know, without, you know, with, from her father, you know, and yeah, that and, was really, and, and you were a junkie. Right. <laughs> so like, she jokes about like what a great mom she was and like, but I get it. Like I was a single mom too. Like she was doing the best she could. Right. And you know, she had her own, she had things she was dealing with too. Like she was dealing with like a terrible custody battle and a, a, you know, un unusual divorce circumstances. And, you know, my father was, you know, crazy, you know, so, you know, she had her own things that she right. was dealing with and she did the best she could. And so I, I do not in any way blame her for like, 
my my life. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's that's you know that's it's what that it is what it is kind of you know. Yeah, as time goes by and you get a little perspective, you know, you realize holding that kind of resentment against uh, a parent for not being a perfect parent is all, is much more of a, a problem for you. You know, like uh, my yeah. you know, my mother was an alcoholic. My father never really did anything to to step in between her and the chaos she caused, and I I blamed him about that for years and years, and then you know. You know, then he, then he, all of a sudden he's in his eighties and, you know, he, yeah. it's like, well, you know, what are you going to do? I'm sure he wasn't, you know, d- deliberately trying to, to screw with us, but, uh, yeah. you know, it's just, it's tough. Your, your parents, mother. Parents aren't perfect. We're just no. people. We're just yeah. people. I mean, I, God knows what our kids are going to say oh, about us. God help <laughs> us. Years, <laughs> and who knows? I mean, your, your mother in the book, I thought, um, when she takes you to Alateen, yeah. So yeah. I, I feel like, you know, little things like that, you know, if you're looking at it from a bird's eye where, I mean, what was that like for you? I mean, it shows that she knew that you needed this support, you know, having your father being an alcoholic and taking yeah. you. Um, so it sounds like that she was thinking about, you know, supporting you and she knew that these things were, were you know, really difficult for you. Um, yeah. You know, what was that like uh, going to Alateen the one time? It, the way you wrote it, it sounded like I could picture myself as a teenager being dragged there, you yeah. know, how yeah. awkward that was. Yeah. And I wasn't even a teen. Like, I was like eight, you know, like, I, you know, there were younger kids. You know, there were a lot of younger kids there. Um, but um, yeah, it was really awkward. I, I really didn't want to go. Like, I would, I, at, you know, at that age, like, I was pretty resentful of my dad that that he just kept disrupting our lives you know because things would if he was like um less present in the house and was like really on one like really on a bender or like seeing maybe had a girlfriend on the side that he was spending a lot of time with and he wasn't home as much life at home was more stable like it was more even tempered you know and then my dad would you know be back more often or you know like back in or not at rehab or whatever and and things would be disrupted again. Right. So, uh, so to me, like going to this, th- that meeting as a kid was like this disruption. Like I was like, Oh my God, like I have to do this thing because of him. Right, <laughs> you know, like right. I was, I was really resentful that I had to go. And I, I already felt different from like other kids because like, I, I didn't, I didn't think anybody had problems. Like we had, right. home. of course, that's not true. Like everybody's got things at home, but, um, not necessarily the things I, <laughs> but you know, like, but you know, we all have, there's always things like nothing's perfect. You know, like it, it's not the way it looks on the outside. And so that was just like one more thing where I, like, I was terrified I was going to see somebody from school. Yeah. Yeah. Or, when you wrote um, that, I was thinking too, when I first went to AA, I was like, Oh my God, what if I see someone I know? And then yeah, uh, yeah. He, my sponsor time said, well, they're there for the same reason you are. So and I, <laughs> yeah, oh, right. Right. But as a, yeah. as a tween, you know, how hard that must be to, to get that perspective. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, it was awkward and yeah. you know, we, we didn't go back. <laughs> right, so, right. So, that was so, it. I was, so I was like, <laughs> but yeah. So, um, so we've sort of alluded to kind of the insanity that went on in your house when you were growing up, but, uh, you know, for the benefit of people who haven't read the book, maybe we should kind of dip into that a little bit. Um, yes. Yeah. So, so you were, you're in California now, but you were not always a California person. No, we were California in Nebraska. Girl. So that's, yeah. that's where you raised, you were, you were raised, uh, born and raised in Nebraska. How, how yes. long were you in Nebraska? For. until i was about eight and a half okay and there, yeah. there's a reason why you <laughs> left nebraska at eight and a half <laughs> mm-hmm. yes uh, uh, yeah. yeah my parents my, my parents have had like a rocky relationship like my the entirety of my life um so my my dad's alcoholism progressed as as it does and he was drinking a lot and he was ha- was also doing drugs like you know, like apparently lots of drugs. And so he was getting more erratic, more paranoid, more um, just, you know, crazy for lack of a better word. And was dating a woman that he was also was using with. And so they, 
they ended up they ended up leaving like just taking off for a while where, where nobody knew where my dad was. So this is while he was still married to your mother though. Still married to my okay. mom. And right. he and he and this woman took off and were living in um, another state for like weeks, weeks and weeks. My mom didn't know if my dad was dead or where, you know, like didn't know, you know, where he was. And so then um, my mom finds out where he is. And then my dad ends up going to rehab for a brief stint. And then my parents end up separated and are going to divorce. And then that time my dad decides that, that my mom shouldn't be alive anymore. Right. He decides that um, he wants to put a hit out on her. And so... Um, this is not an idle threat. I mean, he had a lot of guns no, and stuff. And he had he, guns. Yeah. And he, yeah, so... And he had asked for the guns back, which, you know, as a kid, like, I didn't know that. But, you know, I found out after the fact that um, he had come and got all his guns. I don't think... the. I don't think from what I understand and from what my mom has told me, I don't think he was planning on killing her. I think he was planning on having someone else kill her. And he said something to you when I... You know that more really, than once, right? Yeah, I detailed it once in the book, but it was it was. It's you know, alarming. Really, yeah, when your yeah. father is dropping you off, I think he was in in that scene and said something like, "Your mother shouldn't be alive." You know, it's such yeah. a like, oh my goodness, what well, you know? To, yeah, like, what are yeah, you supposed he, to yeah, think? He, you know, he yeah, it was it was terrifying, and like you know, on top of it, like, um, he wouldn't he would keep me blindfolded unless we were yeah. at his house. So, so, so that she was, couldn't find where you were. I thought that must have been so bizarre yeah. for you. You're getting in your dad's car. He's like, okay, put this blindfold on so you don't know where yeah. you are because your mother's crazy. And you're like, wait a second, who's crazy here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He was very clear that he, he was like, I don't want your mother knowing where I live. And, you know, he would just, you know, he'd be rambling about like just paranoid, crazy things, you know, like you do when maybe you, been doing too many drugs and drinking <laughs> constantly you know and so he would blindfold me and that's how i was you know shuttled back and forth from his house from his house that he had now with the new girlfriend i'd be blindfolded and um and, you know that's terrifying as it is you know like that's that's scary as a kid like you know and i'm like yeah, you still I, trust I him because he's your father on the one hand. I'm sure how mixed those emotions where you're like, oh, it's my dad. So I'm sure it's not that bad, but it's weird and I'm uncomfortable. Like that must have been I, so I think I would yeah. say I would safely say that I always had an amount of mistrust with my dad because mm -hmm. he was so like there was never a like, oh, things will be fine because I'm with dad. Like, you know, he was, <laughs> you know, like it was more like it was always concerning. If it was just me and my dad, like because he would want to go, um, oh, the bridge is out. Let's see if we can make it across or um <laughs> Or, it's right. a, you know, like, or chasing tornadoes or storms. He had, a, he had a police radio in his bedroom. And so, like, that was fun for him. Like, he would he would want to go out in the car with me and, like, you know, go chase whatever thing was happening. Wow. Or flying kites on the top of a building was another thing we would do. And it was scary, you know, like, because I, I really, I remember flying kites on the top of buildings. Jeez with him and and thinking and really thinking as a little kid he might throw me over wow 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 oh, that's yeah i like, mean that's, that's not rough. like that's not something you like like retrospectively i'm like wow like i can't even imagine putting my own kids in that sort of space where you know like where they would be that terrified you know but yeah. he, and he almost thought he almost got like had like you could tell where like he thought it was fun to kind of scare me, you oh, know? Right. And so. that's even more terrifying. That's even more yeah. terrifying. Yeah. 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 So, so, so at some point, um, your mother got wind of this yeah. plot yes. to, to, to knock her off. And what yes. it, is that when they, she took you out to California? You sold the house yes. pretty quick. We sold the house. <laughs> like, yeah, the house went on the market like right away. Yeah. And, um, yeah, my my grandfather and my uncle came out from California to to move us back with them. So we, you know, loaded up a rider van and <laughs> took off. And that was that was it. But you had to go back, right? To, I did have to visit. You thought you escaped. I mean, did you have a relief, a, a sense of I've escaped? Or was there still a lingering like, oh, uh, 
I really thought that like once we left Nebraska that you know that like that was you know as a brand new start it right. was all gonna be everything was gonna be sunshine and roses from from there on out like I thought like yeah I did I felt relief like I was um I was sad about leaving Nebraska like I was sad about leaving what the rest of my my you know my grandparents and uncles and aunts and stuff lived there and all my friends that I had known all my life, you know, like, so it was sad, but I thought like, this is going to be great. And we, we'd spent so much time in California. It was not unusual for us to come to California like several times a year because my parents were splitting up. Right. <laughs> so, you know, it was like a thing where, you know, like we'd be here for a week or we'd be here for two weeks or, you know, um, and then we'd always go back. So, you know, like the, the rider van coming and the threats mm. and all that, and the house for sale was like, oh, this is really happening. Like we're really going this time. So there was relief and, and it was, it was you know, like, it was short lived for twofold because like my dad, you know, then got the courts involved and said, oh, she can't take her out. My, you know, my mom couldn't take me out of the state. And so he had me sent back to Nebraska which was when he attempted a kidnapping. <laughs> and yeah, um, talk a little bit about that because that's uh, that's sort of kicking it up to another level. Uh, yes, it crazy. escalated. Yeah. yeah, yeah, in line with my dad's behavior, but not. Um, yeah, but definitely kicked it up. Yeah, he he had plans with with his new the girlfriend. Now it was his wife, and um, or maybe they weren't married yet. I think I think they. I'm trying to remember now. I had I detail. I had it all written out for the book, and I can't remember if they were married now, or if they were still girlfriend and boyfriend. But regardless, it was the same woman. And um, that's Tony. That yes. He was with, right? Yeah, Tony. Um, and so they had, you know, they had this plot to kidnap me, and I don't know how they thought. I don't know how they thought that would work. She so um, they were dragging me and. You know, tr and I, I caught when I could hear them talking periodically about like, you know, like not, not me never going back, you know? So, yeah. um, I called my mom like during the middle of the night and told her what was going on. And so I, I was got, got sent back to California and then, um, she, my mom got her lawyers, the law involved and was sent back to California. But then I had to go back later, months later to testify against my dad. Wow. So, so um, did he get yeah. arrested uh, for this? No, no, wow. no, no that's unusual. No. I mean, yeah. I, I, what was, what was he drugging you with? Quaaludes. Yeah. Like the full lemon thing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And there were other pills I took too, but that that's the one that I remember. I don't remember. I just, for some reason like that, I think because it said lemon on it, like it, it right. stuck out to me. Yeah. But, and I remember it being kind of chalky and like, yeah, but I don't. Your allergy pill. It, it, that was <laughs> how she's like, oh, you know, I remember reading that and thinking, wow, that's really creepy. She's like, you know, you, you have allergies and, and you better yes. take this. And then waking up in the middle of the night, you know, when you're dead and you run into Tony in the hallway. And she's like, oh, do you need a pill? You know, or take a yes, pill. And I was like, yeah. oh my God, my heart sank. Yeah. I yeah, mean, the, the whole so. thing is just so crazy because I guess part of the plot was they were going to squirrel you away to some some uh family compound in the Appalachian yeah, the mountains farm. or something yeah. like, <laughs> like that. Go to the yeah. farm. How, like you you can definitely see how his mind was completely off off the, his rocker because one because he yeah. thought he would get away with it and yeah you know and and two just the very idea of it um but it, it like blows my mind that there were no legal repercussions for for giving you the the drugs and 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 you know, plotting this whole thing. Yeah, yeah I know. And, and, and he also, my mom, you know, my mom and I were struggling terribly on top of that. And he was, she, she was allotted $1 a month for child support also. So I don't wow, know what. Don't spend it all in one place. Thanks. Yeah. It was, it was like a slap in the face, you know, like it was just terrible. Like, um, thankfully, you know, she got, got money from the house in, in Nebraska selling because mm. like, you know, that would otherwise, yeah, I can't even imagine. Like it, it was, it was, a, it was rough. It was a, a rough few years. 
Well, at least you didn't have to go back and have any more visitations with your old dad. Yes, um, yeah. But unfortunately, you fell into the arms of your grandfather out west, which yeah. is where things took a, take a really ugly and, and even more serious turn. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, things began to get what you thought was better. You're now safe in California, and you're starting to, I mean, you're still the different kid in the local schools, but it sounded like you were beginning to find your people, and um, I thought it was a really interesting scene where you discover the um, that empty house, and that's the one yeah. I think we were just talking about, and it, it was a popular house, but, you know, painting that scene, and then, like, how were you feeling at that time, before the abuse with uh, your grandfather, you know, began, or you began really being aware of it? Like, how were you feeling before all of that began to uh, happen to you when you realized I was, I was pretty excited. Like, I was excited to, you know, like to be in California. And I had friends here in California. Yeah, you're like finding here. yourself. You're being this yeah. new person that you like. Yeah. You're getting tan. You're like, I'm one of these people. I'm a <laughs> California. Yes. Girl. And then, yeah. it, you know, and then it all goes uh, sideways. Yes. Yeah. It was. Um, I really, I remember very much feeling like this cannot be happening. This, this can't be happening. You know, like kind of just being like, feeling like, it, you know, detached from it. Like, where, you know, like where I was disassociating mm. and like trying and couldn't understand how I had left one bad situation for another. Like, how is this possibly happening? Like, this is supposed to be better. <laughs> So it was, it was really hard to, to swallow that, you know, that, that, you know, I, that now I had, that I was dealing with something that was maybe worse, like a worse right. situation because um, in many ways it was like my dad, like, you know, like that, you know, like with my dad, I was somewhat, you know, like my mom protected me a lot from, from like my dad in the way that like, if he was drunk or like being like, you know, like his temper was exploding or there he was raging or whatever. My mom was, was trying to protect me in our mm -hmm. home. With my grandfather, my mom had no idea what was happening. And mm -hmm. so like, I was just kind of like on my own, <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, like you have to deal with this by yourself. Like I didn't want to, I was terrified to tell anyone about it. Like, like she would, she would might, she believe you even? I mean, you probably felt like nobody would, you hardly believed it yourself. I hardly yeah. believed it myself. I did. I never thought that my mom wouldn't believe me. And she, and she, when she ended up finding my diary later that, you know, she, she believed it, right? Like she, there was never a, I mean, she was like, is this like, did this happen? You know, like, cause I think when she first found my diary and I'm jumping out a little bit, but when she first found my diary, I think, she was hoping that it was me because, you know, I've always written stories. I think, I think she was hoping that it was just some weird story I was writing. Mm, yeah. Fiction, right? Um, yeah. And when I told her like, no, you know, this is, yeah, you know, it, this happened, you know, like she was, you know, beside herself. Mm. She hadn't had any experience of, like that with her own father. Like there was not, none of that in the right. past. We, question. we talked about that, um, oops, with, um, when we were, when I was working on the book and, you know, talking to her about different incidences and she said, I don't remember mm. anything happening. She's like, and she said, that's not to say that it didn't happen with me. And she, she also um, said, but it, you know, it's in line with my grandfather was also an alcoholic. He wasn't like, he was a sipping, this, he sipped beer, right? And then all day. Yeah. You yeah. Were saying, Lots like, of beer. Yeah. Your dad was a liquor guy with drugs yeah. and grandpa was more of an all day sipper. All day sipper. Yeah. So he went from like, he'd have black, black he'd have coffee in the morning and then he'd have a switch right over to beer all day long. <laughs> um, so my, my mom said, you know, he was always like, even when she was like, she has memories of him as like a child and a teenager where he was like manipulative or would, you know, tell her like, oh, you can have the car this weekend. And then like, when she was like, okay, I'm going out with the car and he'd be like, what are you talking about? You know, just gaslighter. Mm -hmm. You know, like, and um, so he was, he was, you know, like she, like pattern wise, she was like, I could see how that happened. Mm -hmm. You know, like I can see that happening with him. And um, yeah, so 
but it was still, you know, I mean, that's a hard, hard thing for a parent to have to deal with. I'm sure, you know? Yeah, of course. I mean, so when she, when she found your diary and was reading about it, was he still alive? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And how old were so, you yeah. at that point? I was in junior high. Oh, wow. oh, okay. So it was yeah. very, very or it, Yeah, I was just, I think it was the, at the tail end of junior high. So that was just yeah. a few years after it ended. Yes. Okay. So, it, yeah. So, yeah, it, it had ended. And so I did explain that to her. Um, but, of course, like, she had, she had questions, I'm you know, sure. and, um, yeah. And I went, I went into therapy after that because, you know, my mom was like, Oh, <laughs> you know, like we, you need to address this, <laughs> you know, we need to deal right. with this. Sure. And what was going uh, on with your drug use and the partying and the friends? Like, where does this parallel what's happening with how you're beginning to become dependent on substances or you're starting to use them to cope with these things? Yeah. Uh, how does that fit into where all of this is happening? Yeah. By the time my mom had found the diary, I was already drinking and using. Mm. Like I had already found that as like a a tool. Right. To, There's to no in the background, like, right? Yeah, yeah. Um so the when when I attacked my grandfather, he you know, he was the um, skin under your nails, that description yeah. was so like yeah. vivid and you know. Yeah. I physically attacked him and that was the last time that he tried anything ever again. To, and uh, I mean, he threatened me, like he made some huge threats, like, and, you know, and then, and then he just, from then, from that moment on, he acted around me. He acted like nothing had ever happened. Like you mm -hmm. realized that you weren't going to go along. You weren't acquiescing. You weren't numb. You're like, you said, yes. no. And it's, you know, a miracle. Sometimes that makes a makes an attacker more violent and and come, but that like at least, you know, you set that. We talk about setting boundaries. Well, yeah, that was the best way you knew how at that time. Yeah, um, yeah. So it, and it coincided with me finding like the kids at school. Like that yeah. whole incident was kind of me coming into my own in a number of ways. Like you know, like I was starting to look more like a young woman and like uh I was you know making friends and at in in junior high and like was starting to party and like all of these things were you know like I was coming into my own and like really like kind of you know like vocalizing that more and um so you know, like that incident happened I and I did like there were friends at, in junior high that I had you know, told, told them about this. And it was, you know, something like, like the kid, they were just, they, you know, would jokingly say like, oh, your grandfather, the pervert, like they, you know, like it was kind of like, it was almost a joke. Right. Cause they didn't yeah. know like, how to approach something like that. They didn't know how to deal like with that. it either. Like, or there were other yeah. kids that I hung out with that had had similar experiences wow. with family members, you know? Hmm. So, um, but it wasn't talked about like on a, on a deeper level, it was more just like, yeah, he's creepy or, right. you know, it, you know, kind of brushed off and like, you know, past the, it like past minimized the joint. It. Right. And, you know, it, so, so like the way that we dealt with that and like, you know, 13, 12, 13, 14 was drinking and using. Um, it's, and it's, so I, it's really wild to me, like, because, you know, I grew up in, in that era too, and, and probably had got drunk for the first time at like 13 or 14. But I, I look at my kids now, I'm like, it seems so early, yeah. you know? Yes. Like, yeah. like today it's like, a, it's like a totally different, but back then, you know, I, I, you're smoking, you're drinking, you're staying out. Like it was, it was almost normal. Like everybody was doing yeah. it, you know? Yes. Just, just yeah. Observation there. I don't know where yeah. I was going with that, but. Yeah. I mean, I felt like. I felt like an adult. <laughs> so yeah. I was like, you know, like whatever. <laughs> but you're not. That's the thing. Like, you're, you're, not. you're, you're, a, you're acting as if you have the mental capacity of an adult, but you really don't. You're just a kid. You really you don't. Know? And adults yeah. at the time were generally accepting of, oh, kids will be kids. You know, you used to hear that a lot. Yeah. Uh, boys will be boys. And one of the reasons why, like, sexual assaults, you know, to peer to peer didn't get treated seriously. But I think that carried over to like the use and it was like smoking. a hangover from the seventies, yeah. the eighties and the early nineties. It's like that whole, like, uh, 
you know, drug permissive atmosphere yeah. and everything, you know, it's just like everybody drank young, everybody smoked pot, you know? Yeah. Just, yeah. And my kid now, my youngest is 13 now. And I, I look at him, he's like, he's like a veal. Like he doesn't like, <laughs> he doesn't, he, he doesn't do any of that stuff. Like I know he yeah. doesn't, you know, it's like, yeah, crazy. Yeah. And yeah. my kids, my kids didn't do that either, but I think like I was, you know, a cautionary tale for them because they were like, <laughs> uh, I don't want to go I want to go mom's route. <laughs> yeah, that that's part of um, just raising kids. And we talk about this on the show sometimes, like how, how do we inform our kids that like don't make the same mistakes I did without giving them all of the gory details and maybe, yeah. ex- you know, telling them things that would be, maybe it isn't the best thing for them to hear. You know, my kids are nine and 13, so it's a little bit early, but I mean, how does that help? How did that help with your, your kids? I mean, um, you said like it's a cautionary tale. Um, I think a lot of parents don't know how to explain to their background to their kids or whether they should. Yeah. yeah. I, um, I've i always been like really open with my kids about, about I mean, they I took them to 12-step meetings when they were very yeah. little. So they, they kind of grew up around that. And like, um, you know, like I, they were in the corners of the rooms, you know. Yeah, I so, wonder if that's um, the best way to do it. You know, I, <laughs> bring your kids to AA; they'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> listen to a bunch of those stories over and over. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. I don't know. I, I, yeah, I mean, I would try to keep them like you know, kind of like in my view, but like in the hallway, maybe, yeah. like, so that they weren't like you know, listening to like you know. <laughs> There's some stories going on. Yes. Yeah. See, my, my big fear though, is like if, that I can, I'll tell them all these, this horrible shit that happened to me and they'll be like, but you know, look, he's look, fine. You're now. fine. Right. So yeah. maybe I can have all that fun and also be fine at the I, end of it. I get know? that from and my kids. worry about that. Yeah. Like I'll tell them, yeah. you know, mostly I keep it to drinking. If, if I have to explain to my kids, you know, anything they're like daddy doesn't drink. And if I ever impress to give them more, you know, about it, they'll say, you know, well, look at you now, you know, I guess it didn't ruin your life completely. So trying to kind of get across that, this is a very lucky scenario. And yeah, like, exactly. You don't want them thinking you're fine. Right. They don't, they don't see yeah. all the struggle that went on behind the scenes. Plus you know? I'm not, plus I'm not fine. <laughs> right. That's the other, hello. We're barely holding I'm it together. <laughs> There's nothing fine about any of this. Not fine. So, <laughs> so you, um, you get through junior high and, and, and all that. And, uh, I guess you discovered cocaine at some point in there because uh, that resonated with me. Cause I, I dis- discovered cocaine as well in the, in the, in the eighties and boy, did that change my life. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. You could say cocaine discovered you. I, it discovered me. We discovered each other. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, what's funny is, um, I like, I, I gravitated toward like the stoner kids and like the party kids. And like, I hated smoking pot. I hated it. (laughs) And I really wanted it to work because my friends were, you know, like they, that, that seemed to be the solution for them. You know, Mm. like it, it, like they want to get high. They want to get high. I want to get high. And I was like, yeah, I want to get high. And I, and I kept thinking like, why isn't it working the way I want it to? Because I had had some, you know, prescription meds that, that I did like the effects from, but I wasn't, you know, as a, as a junior high kid, but didn't particularly like, but, but that feeling didn't translate over to to pot. And so that was like too much thinking. It was disappointing (laughs) to me. I wanted it to, I wanted it to feel like the narcotics did and it didn't. Mm. And so the first time, I mean, I remember it very clearly. Like the first, the, as soon as I did the cocaine, I was like, "Oh, this is it!" Yep. Like this is the feeling. <laughs> like this is this is this like makes you feel like those pills. Like it gives me that same sort of, you know, like I felt energized and I inspiration. Felt like it's like inspiration. I always felt inspired, like, right? <laughs> yeah, I just felt like this like ball of energy, <laughs> you know, and just like outgoing and you know, like. Um, so yeah, I, that, as soon as I found that, that I wanted to continue that feeling, that was like the feeling that I wanted to have always, you know, cocaine's good at at making you want to perpetuate the feeling of being Mm -hmm. on cocaine. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. That's the the miracle of it. You just keep wanting more. (laughs) Diminishing returns though. I can speak from experience. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, that was 
that was definitely a, a marking point um, in my addiction. Um, and you sort of, when did, when did the tower records job come in? Cause that to me is fascinating. Cause you know, I lived in New York city in the in the eighties and the tower records downtown was like the place to, to go to yeah. discover music. And I always used to look at the people that worked in there and thought they were the coolest fucking things I had ever seen. I would have given my left arm to get a job in, in that place. Oh, It was so, it was so fun. Like it was really like, I still have, you know, friends that I, I'm in touch with a um, a lot of the people that I worked with at Tower, you know, I dropped out of high school and, you know, my mom was, my mom, well, first of all, my mom wanted me to go to beauty school, which I, I did, but never got, um, never went and got my state board for, because I was like, I don't actually want to cut people's hair for a living. So I went to beauty school, but instead of getting a job doing, you know, like something related to doing, you know, beauty school, I, I got a job at Tower Records instead. Be- better so choice. That was, yeah. So <laughs> and those yeah, were the coolest mom, kids, the Tower Records employees. Yes. I mean, they made a movie about it, Empire Records. Yes. Oh, yeah. You're yeah. living it. But yeah, how did how did that affect your your drug use and stuff? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Um, just a little. <laughs> just a little bit. Yeah. I mean, like if if you know, like everybody there was was drinking or doing drugs. Like, you know, like there wasn't, there wasn't anybody there that I can remember that was like a teetotaler. Like everybody was either <laughs> drinking at the Denny's across the street all day. Great I mean, like people would be gone for hours. Yeah. Like people would, you know, like take, go to lunch at like, you know, 10 AM and not come back until like three in the afternoon. Mm. Like that was not unusual. And, um, you know, like people would just, you know, like be drink, doing drugs in the parking lot, doing drugs in the back room. <laughs> like it was just, you know, it was, it was commonplace. So it made like, it made partying a lot funner. And then you had, you know, like you had the music element too. Mm, like you had right. backstage passes and like, you know, records before they came out and in stores with celebrity, you know, like musicians. And there, there were a lot of really fun aspects to it that that made you know drug use seem you know it's a like a cool, pseudo a it was like a pseudo rock and roll rock star lifestyle like you're kind yes. of like mirroring you know what was going on in, in the rock and roll stuff and uh man honestly it sounds a lot like the um the construction guys I met in rehab had a very similar experience, you know, like as far as drugs be, but yeah, I mean, it was impossible to get away from and to be a part of it. Like you wanted to, it was, you know, all encompassing. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, I definitely had a lot of debaucherous fun. <laughs> yeah. And then I got pregnant <laughs> I, it, and it I had two kids. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> so, yeah, so at some point, at some like point all that, yeah, at some point all that, that crazy Tower Records, uh, living the glamour, the glamour San Francisco life, model life and stuff, it comes to a screeching halt and you, you, I, it was such a, a quick flip in the book to all of a sudden you're, you know, you're hanging out in the burbs, you got the, you got the husband, the kids, it the car, the whole flip. thing, you know? Yeah. It was, it was very, yeah, it was kind of quick, you know, like it was kind of like, okay, I'm doing this now. Like, I just, I mean, I really pivoted. Like it, I really just went from like, you know, being a party girl to having kids. Mm. And I, you know, I had, and you know, I had my daughter and then like right away had my son. And that was like, um, I, I really lo- like, I loved, ha- you know, having my kids when they were like, well, I love them now too. Yeah, right, sure. <laughs> but you know, like when you when you first when you have like little like brand new little beings, like these brand new children, like the possibilities seem endless. Like that I was really high on being a mom mm. when they were, you know, like that was like something that like I was just like, I don't need drugs, I don't need alcohol, I don't need I don't need anything. I have I have this. Like, yeah, this it takes your whole everything. focus. It, yeah. yeah. And that was really like, you know, like that that really was the case for a little while until you know until <laughs> until a doctor reintroduced drugs uh-huh. into the mix you yeah. know yeah because i was you know like i was occasionally going out with friends still and going to parties and things like that but um but you know i was really kind of on the straight and narrow for a little while and then you know i had a a doctor that was 
you know, just, and I wasn't fishing for it all. The doctor was like, just asking me about like, Oh, how's it going? And it was a new doctor that I hadn't, hadn't met before. And so like, you know, I, I just off the cuff, like said something about how I'd been having headaches periodically. And he was like, Oh, it's, you know, I had the perfect thing. Yes. Yeah. I was like, maybe the rep had been in. I don't know. Like, but he, like he readily like offered it up to me, you know, and I, cause I, you know, he said, Oh, it's probably tension headaches. And I was like, Oh, tension headaches. Okay. Mm-hmm. What are, you know, like I was like, yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> I've got two very small kids and I'm young and yeah, that's, well, that's what it is. Yeah. So, um, he, he gave me this prescription and like, uh, almost immediately like i was abusing him you know what, like it was, what was it it was codeine and furoset okay. which um which so i was on a podcast not too long ago and they were like do they make those still and I was like, and so i looked it up they do still make them um and i really i thought like you know i had taken codeine before and kind of thought of it as like a lesser opiate right <laughs> like, right it's a warm you know, blanket like, and that's codeine, all. whatever yeah. it's in cough syrup how can it be bad <laughs> yes yeah so um I didn't think much of it. I and then a little bit later on, he had also prescribed Valium. So I had like this running prescription mm. every month for Valium, and then later Xanax also. Mother's little and, helpers. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and then Codeine and Furacet, and like the I, I you know, like I was I was taking them like you know as prescribed at first, but like really enjoying them, and then <laughs> like it you know flipped to where you're taking like you know like taking like the the maximum amount of the day and then yeah. you're taking like more like you're flipping it where you're taking like you know three every one hour <laughs> you know like you know, like i just it just accelerated and until the like it wasn't enough like it wasn't enough like i had to find other ways of you know filling the gaps in the month so i could get right. the prescription filled you and run then, out of your prescription and it's like wait a second you know i happen to know where i can plug this gap and yes. then uh, and then you start to have a double life which we can yeah. all relate to a lot of this show was predicated on this idea that we're these addicts living in suburban you know long island trying to keep up being like a parent and um, a friend and in the community. But meanwhile, before we got recovery, you know, we, I, at least for me, I, I was living this dark secret life, but even after I got sober, it kind of was still this like secret life of recovery, you know, and kind of navigating that. So this is you starting to try and do two things at once that do not go together. Yes. Yeah. And it, it became, you know, it became harder and harder to kind of like, <laughs> you know, like make it, make it blend. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So I, yeah, because eventually like, you know, I, I had moved on enti- like I was still filling my prescription, but eventually the prescription that I was getting became the gap filler for when I couldn't mm. get heroin and Coke because, mm. you know, I, st- <laughs> I entered heroin got introduced into the mix. Mm. And, and then once that happened, you know, like, the codeine or even the, you know, cause by then I was also doctor shopping and right. like, you know, like hitting, hitting the emergency room with like the worst headache ever, mm. you know, like, and you know, oh, I need to, yeah. yeah, well, you know, I'd ask for Dilaudid right. and you know, a lot of times they give it to me, you wow. know, this is long before the, uh, the opioid crisis and it was, yes. you know, and it, yeah. it was on everybody's mind that you shouldn't be hitting doctor after doctor. Right. And the doctors themselves didn't really, yeah. they really had no database or they were like, they had no database. Yeah. Right. So like there was, a com- they weren't widely using computers and doctor's offices. So I could go to, you know, a doctor in, in Oakland and then hit a doctor in San Francisco or, you know, like, or even in a different part of Oakland or Berkeley, like I could go, 10 miles and go to another doctor the same day, which I did many times <laughs> and, you know, tell them the same story. Like, Oh, like I'm looking for a new doctor. I've got headaches. I've yeah. tried this and, you know, like, and, and they'd write me a person. I'd leave with a prescription. Yeah. You, you have know? a perfect cover story too. Hey, look, I'm a mom. Um, I'm just a regular person. I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not a drug addict. And then they probably, you know, that went a long way. I bet, you know, in the for beginning. Sure it did. Yeah. <laughs> 
you know, yeah, for sure I did. So yeah, so I'd end up, you know, and then I would just fill them different pharmacies, yeah. you know, and then you're trying to juggle like, okay, where did I fill that one? And I went to, you know, guys drugs for this one. And that's where I do the Valium and this, you know, like you have all these little things that, that are all these moving parts that you're kind of trying to keep track of and be a parent, you know? Yeah. That's the trick, um, right? It's like keeping all the lies in order and keeping this person keeping out everything in order. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it must have been exhausting to to try and juggle both of those aspects of your life at the same time. It it probably would have been if I hadn't been doing cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> Give you those extra hours. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, yeah. There was yeah. So <laughs> how long were you able to keep all those balls in the air for, though? I, it was a while. I mean, it was, you know, years, you know, like there was yeah. several years of, of juggling and just, you know, adding things in and that one didn't work. And yeah, this will work once, once I started doing heroin and cocaine regularly, mm, that's hard to that, hide. That, that became the, like the, you know, that was the baseline for everything, you know, like, and then just, you know, I was doctor shopping just to, Kind of, I wasn't doctor shopping as much because I was just filling gaps, you know, like, or, um, you know, like I would get a, get my prescription and I would trade, trade it with somebody for whatever, you know, for something else that I wanted. Yeah. And that's when um, I feel like for me, when I was addicted to heroin opiates, the place where my proverbial makeup started to run and people could see through what I was putting out, I think for me, it was when I was like withdrawing and I couldn't get well, that was when yes. it all fell apart. Like, I feel like I probably could have kept up this facade, you know, unless I died over it, which was highly possible. But the thing that really invaded my act was like, I'm, I'm like withdrawing. I can't get well. How do I explain this? And yeah. one time is okay. Okay. I've got the flu. Okay, great. Um, the next time, oh wow, he's sick again. That's interesting. <laughs> Something wrong with your immune the system. The next day, you know, um, <laughs> you know, money's missing. Like that's it starts to snowball. You know, and that's probably why like celebrities with endless funds maybe can maintain these things because until it kills them. But um, yeah, yeah, so did that start happening to you? You're trying to plug gaps. You're looking more and more desperate uh, to find something to make you get well, and it just starts really uh, coming yes. apart. Yeah, I think like um, friends of mine that were, you know, like from like like other like moms and that sort of thing, like or like you know like the suburban aspect of my life, were starting to like wonder like you know like I said, oh I can't I I have to cancel I'm so sorry right. like excuse excuse it right. or like canceling things with my mom or you know like things like that where where you're starting to do that more frequently mm -hmm. and it looks unusual. I remember one time um, I had like, this was kind of a, like a wake up moment for me. I had, I had had blood poisoning. I had, I had blood, like a blood infection. And then I also had a um, kidney infection at, at the same time. I looked awful. Yeah. Like I was, I, I had to take my daughter to like this, it was like a swim party and I had to go get her a swimsuit. And I remember, so I was dealing with these health issues because of my drug use and it was summer and I was shaking so bad from the infections and like just my health in general that I had on this, like this like vintage, like fur coat. And I went into Gap to go get my daughter a swimsuit and I'm like shaking. I mean, wow. and like, I left the store and I was like, I must look crazy. Like, you know, like I, you know, like I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm like, I've got my hair in like little Bjork buns and I'm all, you know, my makeup's all messed up and like, you know, I'm wearing a coat and like, oh. you know, like I, I, and I'm like, you know, I'm sure they thought like, Jesus, you know, like, look at this woman, you know? Oh yeah. And, I mean, I can totally and, commiserate. That's the you worst. Know? And I was like, oh man, like this, this isn't looking, this doesn't look good. Like, this is a bad look, you know? Yeah, um, you know they can see something. Yes. And it's just, you can see it in people's faces. Like, you know, the way they look at you. Like, yep. like are you kidding me? Yeah, like, <laughs> like, yeah. You know, like, what is wrong with you? You know, and um, 
so yeah, like I, I, I started to become more aware that, oh my God, I, I, I have a problem. I think I have a problem here, you know? Um, so those incidents like those started getting more frequent. Was there a, a turning point where you were just like, I, I cannot sustain this anymore. I need to do something about it. Like, when did you reach that point? Would you call it a bottom? Okay. Do we still do that in recovery? <laughs> I know that, that that's like sort of a, a lightning rod to say you hit I prefer, bottom. I prefer a turning point. A turning because, point. Because it so implies you that you may not actually hit the bottom. Yeah. Mike you didn't can turn to... before you get to the bottom. Yeah. What if that it's is a possible. turning bottom? The turning okay, bottom. turning bottom. Okay. <laughs> that sounds like something that or, involves meth. Or a bottom turn. Yeah, a bottom <laughs> turning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So if we could call it a turning point, call it a bottom, what was the thing? Maybe we just the be thing, the thing. There, there were really, there were a lot of things that kind of led up to the point where, you know, like where I was like, um, I think I, I, I had a bottom, like, in, like when I had, a, I had someone that I was dating that died. And so that was, that was probably the bottom. But um, I continued to, I, I swore off drugs and was like, you know, I'm done at that point. However, I didn't stop. <laughs> like I, I, I swore them off and you, I wanted yeah. to stop. You set the I, intention. We, we I set done. the intention. <laughs> yes. You know, I, I wanted to, I didn't know how, and, and I was grieving and like, mm. you know, like there was, there was grief and there was loss and there was, um, all these things that like, you know, like just, you know, all of the things were like kind of happening where you're like, I don't know how to do this anymore. Yeah, it's hard to and, lie to yourself when you get to that spot. Yeah. Like I got very yeah. good at lying to myself, telling myself yeah. stories, but you get to a place like that. And all of a sudden, even you don't believe right. you anymore. I wasn't believing right. myself. You, you can't buy it anymore. And that's, yes, that's the turn. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that was a turning point for me for sure. Um, but I, it took me a long time to dig out of that turning point <laughs> before right. I could actually get help. I had, there was someone at the memorial service that, um, I kept running into like while I was actually in the couple of years after that, where I, um, and they had got, they had gotten sober. And so I couldn't, like, I couldn't figure out how. They, they seemed like a unicorn. Like I was like, how, right. how do you, it's a magic how are trick. you sober? Or yeah. like, I didn't believe it. Also, I was like, mm -hmm. I'm not really sober. Like, yeah. <laughs> there's like, no way. What are, yeah. what are you talking could, about? Yeah. They couldn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because they were, you know, in my circle of friends and, you know, used like I did. And so, um, I, it, it was like their persistence in like reaching out to me that made the difference. You know, that because they just, you know, kept like, hey, like, you don't have to live like this. Hey, do you want to go to a meeting? <laughs> you know, like, there's a way out. You know, like, they kept, they kept kind of like throwing the idea, not in a pushy way at all, not in a judgmental way at all, just like throwing the idea out that like, if you want to, if you want to quit, if you want out of this, if you want to stop, I can help you. I will help you. And that's the and power. Think, yeah. Yeah. And it was, it was hard like to reach out and to ask, even knowing that they were offering it to me, it right. was hard to reach out, but I really, I got to a point where I, I didn't know what else to do. Like I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't, I had no clue how to stop. Like, and you know, I, I tried all the like, you know, kind of textbook AA literature things like switching Right. You're switching from scotch to brandy <laughs> like you know switching yeah yeah, yeah yeah all these things and like you know like it, or changing the like the the like you know like i'd be like i'm not gonna do heroin i'm just gonna do coke right. <laughs> you know, i'm just gonna do prescription pills as prescribed and you know, like all these things that kind of were like worse i was setting myself up for failure because i couldn't i couldn't moderate i couldn't moderate so like anything i did wasn't going to work because mm. it would, you know, like I was still drinking and using and, and couldn't stop. So, um, it was, you know, for me, like it was a, it was a combination of like being on methadone and we're, and being at a methadone clinic and having a counselor that was like actually a really fantastic counselor that was very 
invested in like getting me my life back mm -hmm. and w between my counselor and you know this this woman that I didn't really know that well only knew through like partying <laughs> you know and um you know I was able to ask for help and like go go to a meeting and like actually start working on my recovery and listen to other people that were like I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show you how to do this. So that's like a harm reduction, um, like a great example of harm reduction working. I mean, we hear a lot in recovery about, you know, how terrible methadone can be and people in the rooms talk, you know, sort of disparagingly about methadone clinics. A lot of addicts do too, people who went through it. There's a lot of downsides to methadone. Uh, they call it liquid handcuffs. You have to go every day. But what yeah. we don't hear enough of is what you just uh, were talking about, where the fact that you're going there every day, yes, it's, it's inconvenient, it's annoying, but it puts you in a place where you're making contact with someone who can further your recovery or where yeah. maybe you wouldn't have those interactions anywhere else. And I think that goes to, you know, what we're doing with harm reduction these days. I mean, that's a perfect example of how harm reduction, even though it sounds shocking, like we're going to give people clean needles, we're going to, but it gives them a place to interface with recovery. Um, and, and that's a perfect example. So you were actually getting something out of those methadone treatments um, beyond just getting the methadone. I think that's important yeah. to, to uh, point out. Yes. Yeah. And it was hard. You know, I had small kids and, yeah. you have to be there <laughs> you know, at six like, o'clock or something yeah and, yeah, so yeah, it was work. hard you know but my my kids have you know like memories of you know me dragging them to the methadone clinic luckily you know like i i took i took getting on the methadone program very seriously i was like this is this is a way out and so i i did whatever my counselor said so, you know, like she, she told me to go to, to, she was like, yeah, go to the 12 step with your friend. And I was like, damn it. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I did not want to. But, and she also said like, they're probably not going to be okay with you being on methadone, which they, which a lot of them were. There nope. were a lot of people right. that were like, you're not sober. And I was like, yeah, it's the devil. I was like, I'm doing the best I can here. You know, like I'm mm. a single mom with small kids. Like I, you know, like I, going away to treatment wasn't an option. Like I, you know, like there were, it, it was the best option for me. And, um, and I'm grateful like that I had people that were like, you know, in my life that, that helped me, helped me, you know, to, so that I could utilize that in, in the way I did. So there's, um, so there's two ways you can, you can use methadone, right? There's, there's a, ma yeah. a maintenance way, which is basically you're on it and a certain dose so you can function. And then there's another part of the program where they titrate you off completely. Yes. So you went, yeah. you went for option, option B. What about all, for B, right? all the options? All of them. I right. <laughs> cycled yeah. through them all. Yeah. yeah. I but, did like the, um, you know, like I did like the short term detox where it's like, you know, they, you, they basically start you off at a higher dose and mm -hmm. then, you know, you're, they're dropping you down at a dose that you don't know what dose you're on until you're off, you know, in, in about a month. Okay. And so I tried that a number of times, like, and, and um, didn't have a lot of luck with that. You know, like it, I would end up getting to a point or I had a boyfriend at the time that, you know, like we would be like, you know, oh, screw this. Let's go, get, let's go late. Like, you know, like my, yeah. you know, like let's go get, get some coke. And so um, I ended up also with my, um, counselor's suggestion was like you need to she like straight up said like you need to get rid of that man yeah. and i was like i was like what yeah. <laughs> but uh you know she was like it's not you're you're pulling each other down you know like you're not gonna be able to get you're not gonna be able to succeed if you try to make this relationship work and you have two kids to think about right and no and she was very blunt about it she was like you know if you need to step up. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so like the relate we, that we split up and, um, I, she suggested like go on maintenance for a while because I think, you know, like she, we looked at, you know, she showed me statistics and stuff. And we talked about it, how like you have a better chance at like long-term recovery if you are on maintenance yeah. 
as opposed to trying to detox in mm. Yeah, the, the numbers with, don't lie. Yeah. The numbers don't lie. And still today that's true. Like, you know, it it can be a great tool. Like methadone used properly can be a great tool and very successful. So so I did it. You're yeah, a success so story. Yeah. And, and, and a success story. And it's important to hear, you know, I think there's there's more gray area than people want in things like this. People like things to be black and white because it, it seems like they have more control if things are black and white. You know, but the truth is, it's like we always say, there's a spectrum of addiction, just, you know, substance use disorder. And then there's a spectrum of ways to recover. And so in sookie has got a perfect example of how, you know, methadone and harm reduction can really, really save a life. I know that Suboxone yeah. was a big part of me saving my life for a lot of the same reasons, uh, that the success you had with it. Yeah. And, uh, and how are you using that experience now to, uh, on the things that you're doing to give back and to help others today? Cause I know you're still very involved. Um, you're very involved in recovery and, yeah. um, and harm reduction and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. I, I really like to advocate for people. Like I like people to know that whatever, whatever option they choose to do to get sober or to find recovery in their life is, is personal. Like my, my history, my drug use is not going to be the exact same as anyone else's. Like we're all our each, we're, we're each individual in that our, our stories may be similar, but like nobody's going to have the exact same. Nobody's, Nobody's you, nobody's me. So of course our recoveries are going to look different also. So I think like, it's really important to be open to, you know, Suboxone, Methadone, like, you know, Psych Meds, Dharma, like whatever, whatever um, therapy, whatever thing works for you. Like if it's working in your life and you can incorporate it in a way that is benefiting you, keep doing that. Like just, you know, and, and listen to the people that know more than you about it, you know? Yeah. Lean on your support. And that, that's so hard to do yeah. too. Like you were saying, even when someone's reaching out a peer of yours, who's yeah. done it, you're still in disbelief. Um, and that, you know, they're not really doing it, you know, yeah, um, but yeah. the ability to do that. And, and that's the, the essence of 12 step really. And it's one alcoholic helping another. It's one addict, you know, reaching a hand out and, uh, and offering your experience. And, um, so I, I imagine that that's very rewarding to see others, you know, be able to recover when you're helping them. But I mean, it's gotta be also devastating when a sponsee or someone you're helping keeps falling off, like how you keep up the enthusiasm and keep giving them support, even though they may be, uh, falling down. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I try not, I try to, especially with sponsees, if I, you know, like if I have a sponsee that has like, and I have had, you know, people that are were chronic relapsers or, you know, like right. chronic relapsers. Um, I, I don't like to look at that as a failure. Like I had so many attempts at trying, you know, like before, before I like actually like walked into 12 step, got a sponsor, like did everything like, that was suggested of me to do. I had so many times that I just like went back, went back to it. Like, Oh, I'm just going to go have drinks. I'm just going to go have some coke. I'm just going to be you know, like, I kept doing it. I kept doing it. I kept doing it. So I, I don't like to look at as a failure. Those were all steps that got me where I am today. Right. And I, I think that like, you know, if you've been using for like I, I used for a long time, you mm. know, like I drugs and alcohol were a part of my story for the majority of my life, you know, up until that point. So I had a lot of practice at doing drugs. Like, so you have to like grant yourself the lee leeway to have practice at mm -hmm. recovery. Yeah. It it's it's it is hard to do. Like sobriety is is so like it's so hard to get sober. Yep. Like it's so hard to to like really like get recovery <laughs> yeah. but once you get it you're like oh i know how to do this like right. I, yeah it something clicks eventually it's gonna click but it's but it's like getting somebody over 
the notches where it's like, I swear to you, it's going to get better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, and they're like, I don't know. I'm still feeling pretty terrible. <laughs> you, <laughs> you said know? I would feel better. No, yeah. but you're laying, but, a, you're laying a strong foundation that people can sort of work off of though, you know, whether or not it's early yeah. days or in the middle or later on, you know, the, the you know, it, <laughs> I mean, I, the first AA meeting I went to was in 1993, and uh-huh. I got sober like four and a half years ago. So it took you, you long know, enough. Yeah, well, you know, yeah. I'm a slow learner. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty dense. But, yeah. But you know what? Sometimes but, it takes time. But that stuff was still in there. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Like that yeah. first Alateen meeting was maybe creeping in the back of your mind, you know? Yes. Was it at all? Yeah. Even if you didn't think so. Prob- well, I mean, it wasn't a little bit because the language, yeah, I recognize the la- like the language is similar. Mm-hmm. You know, the language is still similar, even you know, the language that my dad would use when he was doing like, you know, brief for brief intermittent periods where he would be doing. You put the serenity, the Lord's prayer was on the wall. I like that. (laughs) that scene. So yeah, in Sookie's book, uh, See Swallow Me, there was like when he was on the wagon, your father, there was the Lord's prayer plaque hanging on the wall. Was it? Or was it it the serenity serenity prayer prayer or something like that? It was a serenity prayer. The serenity prayer. And it went with none. I don't know where it my dad match. got it. Yeah, it didn't right. match anything in our house. Like it was, <laughs> it was, it was like a thorn. Like it was just like, oh, okay, it, it, yeah. It was just it dad's was, on the wagon. But when you're yeah. off the wagon, what was hanging on the wall? Something with a the, barometer. The barometer, <laughs> right? And it yeah. was the beer can. Uh, what, what there was, was a beer can pull tab right. as the hook on the back of the serenity prayer, which right. I, I, <laughs> this is so perfect. Which, you know, probably somebody thought it was really funny. When yeah, they yeah. Did it, Cause it was like very homemade, like decoupage, like shellac, like this, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, like hand, you know. praying hands yeah. on mm-hmm. this wood slab. Yeah. It was just, yeah, so whenever that story. was up, yeah. like I was like, oh, okay, like there's, I, the, okay, uh, we're in an alcohol free zone right now. Yeah. The, the church basement aesthetic, yeah. you know. The on air. Yes. Yeah. Here yeah. We go. All right. Well, I think we're. Uh, yes, we've kept you long enough. Yes, indeed. But um, I, it was great speaking with you, Soki. We really appreciate it. It was great it. speaking yeah. with you both. I'm really, I, I was really excited to come speak with both of you. I really like both of you guys. Yeah. Lot. Thanks so, so much. Yeah, go out and get both. Suki's book. Go, go buy see swallow me. It's See, a great read. Is it upside down? It is upside down. Sorry. It is. But I mean, you know, <laughs> read it however you want. Yeah. yeah I really enjoyed it. <laughs> read it backwards. Who cares? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, Yes, yeah. uh, write to us um, and write to Sookie. She's uh, she's on the Dopey uh, the Dopey Nation group. Um, I think she may or I may sure not am. be on the Recovery in the Middle Ages group, but we're all on both. So if you want to reach out, uh, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? The be- I'm I'm on Instagram all the time. Awesome. So if somebody wants to chat with me or talk to me, it's Suki underscore Joe. Yeah, it's uh, you have a strong Instagram game. I I I'm envious. I try and figure out how he and I can like uh, market like that, but I I can't. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think can't do the hair. I can't do the things like yeah. the know, nobody the wants things. to see me dance around yeah. anyway. No one so. wants to. <laughs> you don't want to dance around and make mocktails. Yeah, no, it's, it, I, I don't know. I think we would lose subscribers. I don't. Know. <laughs> I don't, I don't we'll, we'll we'll have a business meeting about it. Yes. All right. <laughs> Thanks, so Suki. nice to talk to you both. Thank you. you too. Thanks, Take Suki. Care. We did it. All right. We did it. Wait. And we're not back. What's the opposite of being back? No, now we have to leave, but we have to oh. sign off in our traditional way. Well, thank you so much for listening. I thought that was really great. Yeah, um, that was awesome. Sookie's awesome. It was yes. cool to meet her and then to have, read her book and really just um, to dive into it. Definitely, guys, give this book a read. It's a quick read. It's really well written. Um, it's very descriptive. If you um, like the 90s poetic, and, and the art scene and the music scene that went on in California in the 90s, it's got a lot of stuff like that in there. Yeah. And uh, just uh, it's a great tale of uh, recovery and redemption. So thank you so much, Suki Jones and her book, See, Swallow Me, available now. But that about does it for today. I had a great time. Did you? Yes. Thank you so much for listening. Visit us at middleagesrecovery.com, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Facebook, Instagram, Spotify, YouTube, and Twitter. So tweet us at twat, you twit. Yes, I know. It's called X now. Support your and favorite show. And we don't have show. a website either. So. Don't tell anybody. Drop a five-star review. We will read your review on the air. Please. Join the private Facebook group. Say hi to 
me, myself, or Suki, hopefully, if she joins up. What about me? And uh, you can talk to Mike, you know, Mike R at MiddleAgesRecovery.com. <laughs> yeah. That's right. They should email you. Right. Um, the best way to help he doesn't the want show, me on Facebook for some reason. Avoid Facebook. <laughs> I don't want to be on Facebook. <laughs> How's, what's the best way to help the show? Mike? Share it with a friend. Share it with Several a friend. Several friends, ideally. Um, and the best way to do it is share it with a friend. That's what I always That's say. What I just said. So please share the love and help grow the yeah, RMA movement. movement. And as, and as we, we say, say non proficiat, proficiat perfectum. perfectum. That's, That's progress, not perfection. Stay fresh, fucking cheese bags. See you next time. Goodbye. Be good.